Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Live, India's Voice to the World. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. US President Biden urges Egypt, Qatar to press Hamas on hostage deal ahead of fresh round of talks in Cairo. Maldives Foreign Minister thanks India for allowing export of essential commodities to the island nation. The UN Human Rights Council adopts five resolutions, including one calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. India supports UNHRC's resolution on Palestinian self-determination right. Campaigning in full swing for India's general elections. India's PM Modi to hold public rallies in northern Indian state of Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. And in cricket, Sunrisers Hyderabad beat defending champions Chennai Super Kings by six wickets. And a fresh round of talks aimed at arranging a Gaza ceasefire in exchange for hostages held by Hamas terrorists is being planned for Cairo this weekend. The U.S. President Joe Biden wrote letters to Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad al-Thani, on the state of the hostage talks and he urged them to secure commitments from Hamas to agree and abide by a deal. Biden told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a phone call on Thursday to empower his negotiators in Cairo so that a deal can be reached as soon as possible. CIA Director Bill Burns will lead the U.S. delegation to the Cairo talks. The United States and its allies view a ceasefire as essential to allowing more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. Under the most recent proposal, Israel and Hamas would agree to a six-week ceasefire in exchange for the release of sick, elderly and wounded hostages held by Hamas. Israel also announced it was opening the Ashdod port and Erez crossings to increase the flow of aid into Gaza. While White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan will meet the families of the hostages at the White House on Monday. Israel has dismissed two of its officers and formally reprimanded senior commanders after finding grave errors in the strike on aid workers. The move comes after Israel made public the findings of an inquiry into the unintended killings of seven aid workers. The inquiry found Israeli forces mistakenly believed they were attacking Hamas gunmen when drones hit the three vehicles of the World Central Kitchen Aid Group late on Monday night and that standard procedures had not been followed. The killing of the seven aid workers, who included citizens of Britain, Australia and Poland, a dual US-Canadian national and a Palestinian colleague, stirred global outrage this week. After publication of the findings, WCK demanded an independent commission to investigate the incident. Israeli military dismissed a brigade chief of staff with the rank of colonel and a brigade fire support officer with the rank of a major. Senior officers, including the general at the head of Southern Command, were also formally reprimanded. Firstly, the investigation found that the WCK coordinated everything correctly with the IDF in advance. The findings of the investigation show that there were in fact a number of armed gunmen who boarded and left some of the vehicles that were identified during the course of the event. After some of the vehicles split from the others, the forces that were tracking the vehicles that went south did so thinking that these were Hamas vehicles that Hamas gunmen had entered. This operational misidentification and misclassification was the result of internal failures that led to a critical information regarding the humanitarian operation to not go properly down to the chain of command. The soldiers conducted the strike without any awareness that these were in fact WCK vehicles. At the time, they were certain that they were targeting Hamas. 
Israeli ambassador in Poland has apologized for an Israeli airstrike that killed a Polish aid worker in Gaza this week. Polish Deputy Foreign Minister Anzia Saini said in a press conference he had handed over a note of protest to the ambassador Yakov Livne, who had been called into a meeting and apologized at the outset. Poland's Deputy Foreign Minister said minutes earlier that disciplinary measures against those responsible would not be enough. The ambassador informed him that Israel's top court would conduct a criminal investigation. Poland wants its prosecutors to take part. And as the Israel-Hamas conflict nears its six-month mark, United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres on Friday reiterated his call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in conflict, unconditional release of hostages while protecting civilians and allowing for free aid delivery to Gaza. Nothing can justify the horror unleashed by Hamas in October 7th. And I call for the unconditional release of all the hostages still held by Hamas and other armed groups. Until then, they must be treated humanely with visits and assistance from the International Committee of the Red Cross. The UN chief further said that he sincerely hopes Israel will quickly and effectively boost aid access to the Gaza Strip, describing the situation in the Palestinian enclave after six months of war as absolutely desperate. Following this week's appalling killing of seven humanitarian workers from World Central Kitchen, the Israeli government has acknowledged mistakes and announced some disciplinary measures. But the essential problem is not who made the mistakes. It is the military strategy and procedures in place that allow for those mistakes to multiply time and time again. Fixing those failures requires independent investigations and meaningful and measurable changes on the ground. In the aftermath of this tragedy, the United Nations was also informed by the Israeli government of its intention to allow a substantial increase in humanitarian aid distributed in Gaza. I sincerely hope that these announced intentions are effectively and quickly materialized because the situation in Gaza is absolutely desperate. Israel has approved the reopening of the Erez crossing into northern Gaza and temporary use of Ashdod port in southern Israel after U.S. President Joe Biden demanded steps to elevate the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, saying conditions could be placed on U.S. support for Israel if it did not act. While the United States is on high alert and preparing for a possible attack by Iran targeting Israeli or American assets in the region in response to Israel's strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has said that seven Iranian military advisers died in the strike, including Mohammad Reza Zahedi, a senior commander in its Quds force, which is an elite foreign espionage and paramilitary arm. Iran also said that it reserves the right to take a decisive response. U.S. President Joe Biden discussed the threat from Iran in a phone call on Thursday with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, India on Friday voted in favor of a draft resolution in the UN Human Rights Council that reaffirmed the right of Palestinian people to self-determination, including the right to their independent state of Palestine. The draft resolution on the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination was adopted in the Geneva-based council with 42 member states, including India, voting in favor. The UNHRC adopted a total of five resolutions, including one calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, urging states to prevent transfer of Palestinians within from Gaza and calling on states to cease sale of arms to Israel. The resolution also called for Israel to be held accountable for possible war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in the Gaza. 28 countries voted in favor, 13 abstained including India and 6 voted against the resolution including the US and Germany. While in the latest from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, a Russian strike on Ukraine's Kharkiv on Saturday killed two people and injured at least seven. A high-rise apartment building was damaged and a shop was ablaze in the fresh attacks. Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, has been a frequent Russian target with attacks intensifying in recent weeks.
Well, a 4.8 magnitude earthquake hit near New York City on Friday morning. Local time shaking buildings up and down the east coast and surprising residents in an area that rarely experiences notable seismic activity. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the quake's epicenter was in Tewksbury in central New Jersey, about 40 miles west of New York City, New Jersey. There was a small but noticeable aftershock which had a magnitude of 4.0. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke with New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy about the earthquake and the administration will provide assistance if needed, the White House said in a statement. No major damage was responsive, but engineering teams were inspecting roads and bridges. At this point, we do, do not have any reports of major impacts to our infrastructure or injuries. But of course, we're still assessing the situation and will continue to update the public. We are in touch with the White House, the governor's office, and local elected officials. And I encourage New Yorkers to check on uh, their loved ones to make sure that they are fine, not only from the infrastructure damage, but this could be a traumatic moment for individuals going through uh, an earthquake. And if you feel an aftershock, uh, drop to the floor, cover your head and neck, and take cover under a solid uh, piece of furniture next to an interior wall or in a doorway. People in New York City said they felt a rumbling and shaking. I was scared. I've never felt one before because I grew up in New York and we don't really have them often. So I, I thought it was a train personally and then it just kept going. I felt really uh, strange because it was my first time experiencing that. I was actually at the office and I just left early. So that was pretty crazy to be honest. Um, I was really scared and that's why I'm going home right now and uh, yeah, just hope everybody's safe. At the United Nations in Midtown Manhattan, the Save the Children CEO abruptly stopped addressing the Security Council on the Israel-Gaza conflict as cameras began shuddering. U.S. President Joe Biden has vowed to rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the city of Baltimore after it collapsed last week. Last Tuesday, a cargo boat lost power and hit the structure, bringing it down and killing six construction workers. The unnamed 21-man crew, all but one of whom are Indian citizens, survived. They remained stranded on the ship. During a visit to Baltimore on Friday, the president observed the crash site, spoke with local officials and also met families of the victims. From nearby Washington, DD India's Benji Hire reports. Touring the wreckage, President Joe Biden says he's ordered his administration to move heaven and earth to rebuild the major crossing, paying homage to those who died. That rebuilding effort, though, cannot happen until the debris is cleared, a process that may take many, many weeks. The vessel is still lodged in the tangled metal, its crew still on board, and it's blocking a vital shipping route in and out of the port, one of the busiest in America. Now, the US Army's plan is to fully reopen the port of Baltimore by the end of May. The Department of Transportation's already released $60 million in emergency aid in the immediate wake of the disaster. That's what the White House refers to as a, as a down payment for initial costs. A full restoration, though, will require much, much more. But here, already in the capital, there's a war of words underway. In a letter to Congress, the administration says that the federal government should pay for reconstructing the bridge. Yet the House Freedom Caucus, that's a group of hardline Republican lawmakers, they say they won't support that funding unless Joe Biden agrees to a number of concessions that they've laid out. The House of Representatives and the Senate both reconvene next week. Back in Baltimore, the president used his short address to put pressure on Congress. That's a message that he hopes will be heard 70 kilometres south in the capital. Benji Hire in Washington, reporting for DD India. All right, let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. An animal lover and co-founder of an animal care center named Ankara builds a train out of plastic barrels to give rights to the disabled dogs she cares for at a shelter in Turkey's capital Ankara. 
The shelter currently cares for 560 animals, including 300 who are disabled, all of which were rescued from the streets where they were often abused or hurt. A total solar eclipse is set to occur on 8th of April. The moon will block out the sun for millions of people in Mexico, United States and Canada. So many changes will occur during this solar eclipse. This will be a total solar eclipse and would be a memorable event as it is going to occur after 54 years. A field boasting over half a million tulips has opened to visitors in southern England, promising to bring a burst of spring to Britain. The field features a range of tulips varying in shape, size and colour. The grass was seeded in preparation in the summer last year and the tulip bulbs were planted underneath the turf. Over 100 different varieties of have been planted in the field, local media reported. One of Japan's celebrated traditional gardens in Kanazawa City, Ishikawa Prefecture, is now open for free for cherry blossom viewing. The garden is symbolized as the scenic beauty of Japan. It opens for free in the cherry blossoming season every year. Visitors enjoyed strolling around the garden where cherry blossoms are in bloom but still not flowering fully. And still to come on this edition of DD India Live. Ahead of the Lok Sabha polls in India, we tell you why Maharashtra, a state with 48 parliamentary seats, holds great significance. India's eastern state of Odisha braces for intense heat wave. And in cricket, Rajasthan Royals will take on Royal Challenges Bangalore in Jaipur today. We'll tell you more. The land of Dravidians, Tamil Nadu, goes to polls in one go. How will the National Party's alliance face the political heat with the regional satraps? What are the issues that could find resonance among the voters as India decides? Will the vote share increase help the National Party's get a foothold in the minds of the people? Watch Why Tamil Nadu Matters on the Great Indian Election at 8.30pm IST and 1500 hours GMT only on TV India. You're watching DD India Live. I'm Siddharth Bharatwaj. Maldives Foreign Minister Musa Zamir sincerely thanked India on Saturday for allowing the export of essential goods to the island nation despite the downturn in relations amid rising Chinese influence in mail. In a post on social media platform X, the Maldivian Foreign Minister wrote, I sincerely thank EAM Dr. Jay Shankar and the Government of India for the renewal of the quota to enable Maldives to import essential commodities from India during the years 2024 and 25, He added that it signifies the long-standing friendship between the two nations. India has allowed for the export of certain quantities of essential commodities for 2024-25 under a unique bilateral mechanism at the request of the Maldives government. The High Commission of India in the Maldives posted on X stating that the quotas for each of these items have been revised upwards. India has approved the highest quantities of essential commodities for export to the Maldives since the arrangement began in 1981. Let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. As campaigning is picking up momentum ahead of India polls, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will hold public meetings in the states of Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan today. Prime Minister Modi will also hold a road show in Uttar Pradesh's Ghaziabad later in the day. Meanwhile, the Congress party leaders are also scheduled to hold election rallies in various places today.
India's opposition party Congress on Friday held the election committee meeting at the party headquarters in New Delhi to discuss the upcoming general elections. Party chief Malika Jun Kharge, Congress parliamentary party chairperson Sonia Gandhi, general secretary KC Venugopal and senior Congress leaders from Haryana were in attendance. The party also released a list of 40 star campaigners for the state of Uttarakhand for the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. Leaders including Malika Jun Kharge, Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi among the campaigners. Maharashtra, the western state of India, sends 48 MPs to parliament and is the second highest after UP. The realignment of regional straps and the political bloc for the 2024 elections makes one wonder if it would be better to call it Maha Chaos for the voters. The financial and entertainment capital of India will go to polls in five phases from April 19 to May 20th. The fortunes of the national parties and regional parties merge makes Maharashtra a cracker of an election. DD India dissects why Maharashtra matters in the great Indian election in 2024. Located along the western coastline of India, the state of Maharashtra is a maritime, commercial and a vibrant cultural hub that includes the UNESCO World Heritage Sites like the ancient Ajanta and Ellora Caves. Spread over an area of over 300,000 square kilometres, the state, which is blessed with a 720-kilometre coastline, caters to most of India's maritime trade activities. It is also a major automobile hub and has a rich industrial output ranging from heavy machinery, consumer durables as well as FMCG products. Its state capital, Mumbai, which is well known for its rich architecture, including the iconic Gateway of India, is also well known for the glitz and glamour of the Indian cine world, the Bollywood. Maharashtra, a state important in multiple aspects, houses 48 Lok Sabha or the lower house seats in the Indian parliament, the second highest in the country after Uttar Pradesh that has 80. In the 2024 general elections, the state is going to polls in five phases starting from April 19th to May 20th. That is April 19th, April 26th, May 7th, May 13th and May 20th. The state has 92 million registered voters, out of which over 47 million are men, 44 million are women, while more than 5,500 belong to the third gender. Now coming to Maharashtra's current political scenario, it is governed by the Shiv Sena Shinde Party in collaboration with the Bharatiya Janata Party and the Nationalist Congress Party. Other prominent parties include the Shiv Sena Uddha Balasaheb Thakare faction and the International Congress, which has been playing a significant role in the politics of the state, besides the Bahujan Samaj Party and the left parties, which participate in the polling process. During the 2019 general elections in the state, of the total 48 seats, the BJP won 23, the undivided Shiv Sena backed 18, the NCP won 4, while the INC, AIMIM and Independence won one seat each. Amidst a supercharged political scenario in the state, which has been witnessing the rise of new political factions and collaborative realignments, all eyes are on Maharashtra this polling season. As it prepares to undergo the test of India's populist mandate in the general elections. Election Desk, DD India. Let's take a look at other stories making news today. The Indian Farmers Fertilizer Cooperative signed an MOU with the Acme Clean Tech Solutions Private Limited on Friday to promote sustainability in the agricultural sector. Acme will supply about 200,000 metric tons of ammonia to IFCO through a renewable energy route. This initiative is in line with PM Modi's vision of the National Green Hydrogen Mission. India's eastern state of Orissa is bracing for intense heat wave. Orissa's capital Bhuvaneshwar recorded a sweltering 43.5 Celsius temperature on Friday.
Well, moving on to IPL now, Sunrisers Hyderabad on Friday scored fastest half century in record 21 balls on the way to thrash Chennai by six wickets. Sunrisers Hyderabad registered their second win of the season. SRH won the toss and opted to field first as they managed to limit CSK to 164 for five in 20 overs. The Hyderabad bowling unit chipped in with five different bowlers picking up a wicket each. Meanwhile, Aidan Markram top scored for SRH with 50 of 36 balls. Earlier, most CSK batters go starts but then go on to play a big knock with Shivam Dube smashing 45 of 24 balls with four sixes apart from two fours. Meanwhile, Rajasthan Royals are set to host Royal Challengers Bangalore in the match 19 of IPL 2024 season Jaipur today. Bangalore have won just one out of their four matches. The eighth place where RCB are currently on the 10-team table is a fair indication of their troubles. Meanwhile, Rajasthan have won all the matches they have played so far. They beat Mumbai Indians by six wickets while chasing a 126-run target in their last game and are currently placed at the second position in the points table. Well, reverse tulips on a spring day bloom of turkeys is known as crown imperials. Well, the tulips native to the high rocky areas of the eastern Anatolia region have now blossomed. With the coming of spring, the orange, red and yellow tulips are blooming on high altitude lands. That's all for this edition of DD India Live. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India Live.